Um, for me, another big thing is having the conversations around stopping the financial sales. Which you're very, which you're very passionate. Very passionate about. about. We were talking and joking earlier. There's some things that you know we probably can't share on camera, um, but it gets me fired up. So continue to support those that are doing it, things the right way. And Welcome to another episode of Talking Shop. This is a familiar face if you've been watching the show. Isaiah Douglas. Uh, my good friend here in town. I don't get to do very many in town, so like I'm trying to build up my network of yeah, local advisors. It's getting bigger. Uh, we were just catching up you know, the day before Thanksgiving, wrapping up the year, uh, just talking shop. So we decided to come across the street to the Spark building and record a quick episode of Talking Shop. So Isaiah, real quick, first off, how's everything going? Life is good, can't complain. So you have uh, a, a how old your little guy? Five months. So he is a newly parent, yeah. newly minted parent, sleeping good, everybody's yeah. doing good, which is exciting. Um, so as we were talking over in my office, we were talking about kind of business planning for next year, what we were wanting to do, and that that would be a good conversation. And then there's some other things we want to add on as far as the advisor space in the upcoming sure. year. So the people that are at home have been following along your story, you've got your niche with uh, veterinarians and dentists, right? Yep. Um, got the podcast right yeah. there, the po Veterinarian Success Podcast. So doing a very good, well, very good job of branding himself and carving out this niche. Um, but as you look at going forward next year, after the success you've had this year, what's on your plate for next year? I, yeah, I think um, first and foremost is just trying to continue to push forward doing the same thing, serving those individuals. Um, I would love to continue to support my niche with those that are looking to purchase uh, practices or clinics or hospitals. So for me, a big push is continuing to encourage them, just like a lot of advisors, as they look at, you know, do I want to go out and start my own thing? Do I join a team? Helping them make those decisions because for them, their biggest asset a lot of times is their skill set and the businesses that they own. So continue to support and do that. Build out more content for students um, and continue to give them more advice and guidance and information early on so they don't have some of the pitfalls. You'll talk to older veterinarians or dentists or different people like, oh, I wish I would have known this when I was 30. Mm -hmm. So continuing to build out that content and that's a big part of the podcast and shout out to Dan Routh for shirt and, and being a, a guest for the radio shows he's been awesome uh, for those that don't know dan dan has a, a wife that is a veterinarian as well and so we share that passion of serving that community and we actually met through one of these videos which is fun how twitter and uh, content can help build relationships um, for me another big thing is having the conversations around stopping the financial sales which you're very, which you're very passionate, very passionate about. about. We were talking and joking earlier. There's some things that you know we probably can't share on camera, um, but it gets me fired up. So continue to support those that are doing it, things the right way. And um, for me, the right way is hey, let's get people that are CFPs, get people that are fee only. I know not everyone agrees with that stance. It's something that I personally believe in, and I have no problem uh, having that stance and, and dying on that hill because I do think it's really, really important. Not saying that everyone outside of that is bad or evil. I just think that's a great you know, place to say this is the standard in the industry. And um, so I want to support other advisors that have niches outside of that and continue to put out content to give people and consumers the information they need. And the more people that learn, the deeper they dive, the more that they'll realize there's some awesome advisors out there and I want to see them win and support them, so. So next year, this year, when you come over and we're talking about planning for 2021, as you look back on 2020, what makes it a successful year for you? And let me move this mic up closer so we're not pulling your shirt down anymore. <laughs> Give me a V-neck. Um, for, for me, it's really trying to identify awesome people to, to grow the team. That's a, that's a big goal okay. for me in, in 2020 is to continue to identify people that can help grow. I have a vision of where I want to go, but mm -hmm. it's, I know I can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm by no means the smartest person in the room, the best advisor, and I want to have that team dynamic and approach to, to give a better experience to clients. So I, I know who I'm trying to attract and who I would ideally love to, to partner with or bring on the team. So continue to have those conversations and dialogue would be huge to be able to, to know who I want to bring on. Um, and then just continue to grow and, and bring on clients that, that fit the, the mold of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so continue to attract those next generation owners of, of dental and veterinary practices and, and 
continue to encourage them and empower them to chase their dreams. So, yeah. So real quick, since this video is one of the first ones for my more advisor focused content, you mentioned you have an idea of who you want to attract to the team. What are some characteristics of an advisor out there? Because uh, we're going to talk about something that I think is going to maybe help you in this goal. Uh, but if there's an advisor out there watching that is maybe thinking of making a change or wants to team up with somebody who's doing things um, and has a bright future, what does that advisor look like? Yeah, for me, I, I know where my strengths lie, which is, I think, similar. Like, we've had conversations, not saying that I'm comparing myself to you, but we both love, like, the content aspect mm -hmm. of it, the business development, the experience, and kind of the, the vision and mission of the, the company. Uh, I do like financial plan. I do like meeting with clients. I do enjoy everything about the industry. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to be a, a business owner first and an advisor second. So for me, the ideal partner would be someone that has the, the process, mm -hmm. like the internal like partner where I'd be kind of the external. They would be more the internal. Uh, maybe someone with a CPA background. Mm -hmm. the, the tax knowledge is not ultimately where I came from. That's not my background. I would mm -hmm. love to have someone that has that as their um, skill set grown up and could bring that to the table because it's super important for those business owner clients that I have. Mm -hmm. I have great relationships that I'm not trying to interrupt and, and say that I'm going to you know, start a tax service or anything like that, but just having that, that concept because it's hard to separate the personal from professional life. Mm -hmm. It's so intertwined. Uh, but so yeah, you, that's, you want that's, a that's really kind of who I'm thinking of as far as a partner. So you want a Bill Sweet of yeah. Indiana, basically. Yeah, so you think about disc profiles, uh -huh. right? I don't know if anyone's familiar with disc profiles. I'm a huge DI, really high, lower SC, so I would want to find that, that SC type of person. Mm -hmm. Process, maybe slower pace, going to rein me back in when I get my crazy ideas and I want to run off and do something. And that, that balance, that's mm -hmm. ideally what I want. And I think that's what you want in a partner. You don't want the same person. Mm -hmm. I don't want another Isaiah, maybe someday, but not right away. Right. I don't need another me. Sounds good. Yeah. Anything else for 2020 before I share mine? No, I'd love to hear, you know, 2020, what you have going on and cooking. I know every time we meet, there's something different new. ideas. There's crazy and, ideas, yeah. yeah. Ideas of, of, of pivot. It always makes me joke and think about friends when uh, Ross is moving the cash with the pivot. Yes. Pivot. I'm like, that's, that's I've written. I've written a blog post about pivoting and I used, I think I used a gift for that. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going into 2020, I think with the most clarity of what I'm supposed to be doing than I ever have. So I've, always love being a financial advisor. I always will be a financial advisor, but over the last couple of years, trying to find that niche. So when I first started, I was anti-niche. So I joined yeah. XY, they preached niche, and I wanted to be the guy that proved Michael Kitsis and Alan Moore wrong. You could be successful not having a niche. I used to say my niche was you know, people that I liked. Yeah. Like That is the key. The, the no a-hole rule is kind of what I live by. And I've, I feel like I've done a good job building my business just under that. Like I have a lot of teachers from my past, but beyond that, it's all over the board. Um, last year, I came back from my annual trip in New York City, wanting to be a CEO, build a bigger firm. And as I kind of went down that path of planning for it, I just realized I don't really want to manage other financial advisors. So that's not the direction that I wanted to go. And then I started to notice that I started to work with more and more entrepreneurial clients and I really enjoyed that. And over the last year and a half, two years, I'd say I became entrepreneurial. So I realized, okay, I like working with entrepreneurs. I want to help them build. Um, I want to help them with messaging as well, go above and beyond. So I was going to pair personal planning, business planning, and then the final relate tier of the relationship was going to start building in kind of this content strategy that I love to do. And um, new blog, new podcast, because that's what I do. Like I, if I'm, if I'm going to go down a path, I'm going to create content to grow that business. So it's exactly yeah. what I did. Entrepreneur's Blueprint was launched. I was going down that path, having a good time, and um, started to just pay attention to where I was spending the time that wasn't with clients. And that was a lot of time spent with other financial advisors, whether it's filming, talking shops, having phone calls about, I want to break away, or I want to start a blog, how did you do different things? I just really love those conversations. And I left those phone calls or Zoom meetings feeling energized and also being really excited to seeing the person on the other end of the line being excited as well. Fast forward, um, reach out to Taylor, advisor growth community is launched. And what I've realized and what my focus for 2020 is going to be is the RIA, RLS Wealth Management, will always exist, but I'm not looking to grow it with new clients, which is crazy because as a financial advisor, it's grow, 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 grow. 
I have a great group of clients. I would never want to turn my back on them. I don't want to lose those relationships. So the focus for the RIA is just maintain and actually really try to improve client service. And I really want to focus next year on taking our financial planning to the next level. I've really become a big fan of life planning. And I would say that just through my own personality, I kind of scratched the surface on life planning. I always ask the, deep, the bigger questions, deeper questions, would try to get more about the why, but I never was intentional. So I want to, in our annual reviews, spend more time on the more the why behind. I really want to learn about what makes my clients tick beyond what I already know. And I have a goal of making my client appreciation events tie into the passions of my clients. So I want to find the charities and organizations they're most interested in, which would be part of the life planning process, and make our client appreciation event part service, doing whatever that is, and then the fun part afterwards. So that's the focus for the RA, is just really improve client service, really deepen those relationships beyond what they are. I mean, some of my clients have been with me for 10 years. So it'll be kind of fun to revisit some of those old questions I haven't asked for a while. Um, and you know, I'll take on referrals from family and friends, but I would expect maybe four or five referrals a year. So that's cool. Um, I'd be happy if that's the case. The growth for the business is gonna come through the advisor growth community and through consulting that I'm doing with advisors. And I hate the term consulting. I wanna find a better term for that, but helping other advisors that believe in content, that see that it works, but don't know where to get started, helping them find their voice, craft their story, figure out where to put it and get started. Um, those are the things that I'm most passionate about right now. Those are the things I think I am very strong at. I think I'm a good advisor. I think there are great advisors out there and I would much rather help those great advisors be found so they can help more people. Um, and my clients don't leave me because I said I'm just good. I, I'm a good advisor, yeah. but there are other advisors that, you know, that, that are more detail oriented or have more complex planning that they can do that they can help people that have bigger needs than what I help with. And I want to help those people be found. So my big thing next year is driving the advisor growth community. We have the um, open enrollment coming in January. So we're hoping to get another 100 advisors into the community and really drive a lot of value there. Keep on bringing in great speakers. We've had Annie Duke, we're gonna have Rory Sutherland, we had Kay He, we've had member-led uh, webinars. It's just been a great experience and the feedback's been great. And I really wanna see that do real well. I'm also cautious that uh, I know Taylor and I don't wanna see it grow too fast. So it's kind of grow, but not grow too fast so we don't mess things up. And then on the consulting side, my, my hope is that every quarter I have a couple of advisors that help through the process and that would be what I'm focusing on next year. So it's much more sure. narrow focused. My content will be much more focused. All About Your Benjamins still exists. That'll be moving to just consumer and client focused. And then the advisor of tomorrow, which is on my justincastelli.io website, will be advisor focused. So I'm separating things out and one blog, one blog will be on its own. One blog will actually be on the website. And I can obviously share with people why I'm doing that. I think there's reason and intent behind it. So I'm just real excited about being clear with what I'm going to go and what I'm going to do for a change. Yeah, I love it. What's been the best, what's been the one thing from the advisor growth community that surprised you in a good way that you how, didn't expect? How quickly the community bonded. So we opened enrollment end of August. September was supposed to be a freebie month. Get into Mighty Networks, figure things out, and then October we would start. In September we had conversations going on, people already sharing ideas, sharing documents. We had meetups that happened at Wealthstack, at XYPN Live, at FinCon, and Ta I was at Wealthstack, Taylor was at FinCon, but XY, nobody was there, and they still organized on their own. So this sense of community happened right out the gate. And I think that we both thought it would take some time to build that. We were really worried about September and October. Can we get people to engage enough? And it was right out the gate. It was off to the races. You would have, if you were to go into the community today, you would have thought it had been around for a couple years. Um, awesome. So that was the most exciting part. The other exciting part was just the diverse t uh, advisors that are in there. So it's not all CFP. It's not all fee only. It's, it's across the board. We have new advisors, experienced advisors. And that's really exciting to me because the goal for the group is more of a mindset. It's a growth mindset. It's a collaborative mindset. It doesn't matter what your business model is to us. We think good advisors exist everywhere and we can all learn from each other. So that was the other kind of, that's, you know, 1A, 1B. Yeah, no, love it. So awesome. real quick before we run out of camera time, um, 2020, what are some things you see out there that maybe are gonna be obstacles for advisors? Oh, well, I think we talked about just people understanding, you know, when there's 
there is a downturn. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that the client service look like? What is their approach to running their businesses? There's a lot of different people out there that have started businesses over the past, you know, five years, three years, two years, one year. Um, what does that look like? Also, just the mega merger, obviously, of mm -hmm. TD and Schwab. I think that throws it out there. Altruist is something that we, we've chatted on that mm -hmm. I think is intriguing that people should absolutely check out. I'm a fan, mm -hmm. personally, um, of what they're doing. But I think just trying to navigate how do you bring uh, a, a higher level of service, utilize technology, and integrate and become efficient. Mm -hmm. That's been something that's been in 2019, 2020, or 2020. It'll be there in the future, but become efficient at serving your clients and be able to bring more to them mm -hmm. uh, with maybe not having to say, I'm going to you know cut my costs or change because everyone talks about fee compression, but how can you be adding more mm -hmm. to what you're offering your clients? I think that's a, a big challenge of how do you analyze and, and go through that process. As of the last couple of days, I have a lot of thoughts about <clears throat> TD and Schwab. Um, so I'm working on a blog post now, but I think 2020 could be a big year of consolidation amongst advisors. So I don't know when the recession is going to happen, but to your point, when it does, I think that you're going to see some of these advisors that just started kind of be in trouble. Um, I had the benefit of launching my firm in the middle of 11 year bull market, 10 year bull market, depending on when you, you know, calculate things. That was a huge benefit to get things going. Sure. I didn't have a huge hurdle. Had it happened early on, it would have been a little bit more tough. And I think that while I was prepared, I think as we, not euphoria, but as it looks easier, we see more people successfully launching businesses, so we think we can as well. I think there might be some advisors that launched a little too early that if the storm comes before they're really established, they're gonna have trouble. So I think you're gonna see consolidation. It could go one or two ways. It could be four or five advisors joining together to create one firm. That's one, more, one form of consolidation. Or you're gonna see advisors joining up to other bigger firms. They're gonna find somewhere to latch onto. If you find yourself in that position in your advisor, I would say be very aware of the culture of the firm that you're gonna go into. There's nothing wrong with trying to go out on your own and not succeeding as a business owner, but being a real good financial advisor. Like not every financial advisor needs to have their own firm. Um, which is tough for me to say because I want everybody to follow their passions and follow their dreams. But if you find yourself in a situation, don't jump ship into a bad situation because you just need somewhere to land. Take your time and find the right place so hopefully that's somewhere you could actually stay and last for the long term. When it comes to, so I think consolidation is going to go one of two ways and if the recession happens next year, which I'm not predicting it, but if it did, whenever that recession comes, I think we're going to see that consolidation. The whole merger could speed that up as well because the rumor is Schwab's might start charging you know, platform fees. And for small advisors, just like we do to small clients, they're going to be the ones that have the highest fees that will see the biggest impact to their bottom line. So it might not be cost effective for a small firm to be at Schwab, which they'll never put this in writing, but if you look at Schwab's history, they're not very fond of smaller advisors. And I'm a small advisor when it comes to what they're talking about. So they may not be cost effective for them to stay at Schwab. That's the way of pushing them out because they don't want us anyway. Do you join another firm? Or that's where somewhere like Altruist could come in. So my, my thought today that came up, and this will be my final thought, is it possible that Schwab and TD now are playing a short game? Where the long game is the future of the profession lies with firms like yours and mine. If they push us out and we go to an altruist or fidelity or wherever else might be and we run our business and there's this big wealth transfer from the Schwab clients at the older firms to the younger firms like yours and mine that are now at altruist, I'm not going back to Schwab just like I wouldn't expect a client to come back to a high priced firm when they wouldn't spend the time with them later on. So I understand why Schwab doesn't want the smaller advisor, it's not profitable. But if you're playing the long game, don't you want those clients that are going to be the ones that are going to be working with the future wealth transfer? Don't you want them in your pipeline? Or do you want to push them out and then you're going to try to go get them back later on when I can tell you a lot of us will probably remember that and we'll be quite happy where we're at and we're not going to come back. Does, it's not going to say Schwab's going to you know, dwindle away in the future, but I just wonder if there's that impact that they're just looking short term, not playing the long term game. So that's my new thought that I'm writing about right hmm. now. It's an interesting idea and I, yeah, I would agree with you. Um, there's going to be certain people that, that hold a, maybe a little bit of a grudge when you know, they weren't important before mm -hmm. and now you know, all of a sudden they, they got better looking and they're like, oh, yep. come back. You know? I also think that will help out the TAMPs. I think you may see more advisors focusing on planning, outsourcing the, t the investment work because they can't be on Schwab. It's too expensive. I agree with that. So we do, my, we do our subscription model or we do the AUM still and we outsource it to the TAMP, which has the relationship and then we're in good shape. So I think there's, 
there could be a lot of shifting going on. So I'm excited about the conversations and the videos and the blogs that are going to come over the next year because this is the stuff that really gets me excited. So we're bumping up on 20 minutes. This camera's going to shut off <laughs> here pretty soon. So Isaiah, I appreciate you taking the time. We'll do this again next Thanksgiving, see how things yeah. transpire, see if, we're, if I'm still on the same path, which I know I will be because <laughs> I've never been this clear. So awesome. uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're traveling, so have a safe trip. Enjoy the time with your family. Everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks.